Hi, this is Mike Ines from Alice in Chains, and I'm sitting here with my friend John. And you are watching 4BassPlayersOnly.com. Turn that shit up. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Coming to you on location today from the secret rehearsal studio in North Hollywood, California with Mike Inez of Alice in Chains getting ready for the big rehearsal for the big tour. Hey, Mike. Yeah, halfway through the tour. Yeah, we're on our way to Auckland, New Zealand and uh, start a New Zealand-Australia tour and then Canada after that, so... Yeah, you're catching us in a good spot here. Yeah. You probably have to make two trips, one to New Zealand, one to Canada, because they're not really exactly yeah. <laughs> up the road from one another. But I want to talk about you, because you, you started out, actually, weren't you? A woodwind player, saxophones, clarinets, things like that. Yeah. Uh, tell, <laughs> tell me about your, your, the early days, your musical upbringing. How were you first exposed to music, and what eventually drew you to the bass? Well, I grew up in a big Filipino family of musicians and church folks. And so every other older relative of mine played some sort of instrument. So I basically, you know, came out of the womb into this uh, really nice musical bed for me to grow into. It was funny, like er early in my life, I always knew that I would be doing something like this for a living, you know? Yeah. A lot of people like even in high school don't know what they're gonna do with their lives I knew from an early age I would be making a bunch of racket in a room somewhere you know with a bunch of good-looking crew guys by the way <laughs> I got to do that they take yeah. care of me on the yeah. road <laughs> well so from Filipino descent so when I think of that I think of the place far away in another part of the world where they pretty much traditional instruments like you'd find like pianos guitars drums violins or were they some kind of exotic you know yeah, what? a lot of mandolins uh, acoustic instruments and um, my uncle Matt Inez uh, he was in uh, his high school band had like two guys from Earth Wind and Fire in it and so I came out of literally from the hospital to my grandma's house here in San Fernando about 10 minutes from here and I remember the, the, the story is like the first day I came home, uh, my grandma went out and yelled at my uncle's high school band saying, hey, shut up, the new baby's here. You guys have to stop now, you know? <laughs> and in that band was a couple guys in Earthwind, Al McKay from Earthwind and Fire, yeah. and so just a bunch of, uh, so I, I grew up in this, this cool, like, um, you know, even as a little child, my uncle would go to work and say, okay, don't, don't go play with anything in the, in the band room. It's like, oh, okay, as soon as this car went around the corner, I'd jump on drum sets and start turning on keyboard amps and, you know, so. Well, what about the yeah. bass itself? What, what drew you to that instrument? Uh, once again, my uncle Matt, I, I, I play guitar too, and I had an a, a old Fender Strat that I used to play all the time, and my uncle uh, had a dude that owned him some money. So he got this, I, it was a, like a, a late 50s, early 60s Fender. Uh, it was a, a P bass, but it had the telly kind of, you yeah. know. And I wish I had that bass now, you know, it was one of those. But so the guy gave my uncle that bass uh, to, to pay his debt off to my uncle. And my uncle sold it to me for like 135 bucks. And it was just beat up, so I painted it black. And so uh, I would sit in my room and just start learning like all English stuff like uh, early Elton John or Deep Purple or Jack Bruce, all the kings of distortion bass players, you know, John and Twistle and um, John Paul Jones. That, I was drawn to that, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's where it started. And, and of course, Black Sabbath. So that was it. Easy. And then we went up to, uh, like, I remember in high school going to the Us Festival out here, about an hour from here, uh, east. And, uh, Not necessarily with your mother's blessing, if I, uh, oh, if yeah, what yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I told her I was uh, spending the weekend with a buddy, and uh, I just I basically hitchhiked out there to the Nam show, and I only had, it was twenty bucks to get in, and so the night before was like Bowie, U2, I mean uh, Oingo Boingo, great bands, and I couldn't afford the whole weekend, so I, I went on the metal day because I'm a metalhead, and uh, we j we just got back from South America with Rob Halford, and I I yeah. went out to dinner in. Uh, in uh, Sao Paulo and I was asking him all about that night and he said it was the last night of Screaming for Vengeance tour and and uh, so that Judas Priest performance Ozzy um, it, that's when I realized okay I'm, I'm looking at this there's probably 500,000 people at the show it's the biggest rock concert I've ever been to still you know 
and we play some big ones you know rock and rio and stuff this was bigger the wow. festival is still the biggest show i've ever seen and uh yeah so i was like i figured i had this epiphany at that show i was like i'm on the wrong side of the pa you know i, I gotta figure this out i gotta i gotta figure out how to get on that side of the pa and then it's rooms like this uh in fact this rehearsal studio our secret rehearsal studio here um i got the aussie gig through this place and uh yeah so from that show uh at the us festival it was seven years later i'm in aussie's band and living in ireland with the guy and you know playing it that's how it started for me i would say i went to uh, we were talking earlier the aussie finishing school you yes. know so there was no better college for me than to uh, be in the Ozzy Osbourne band in this, you know, just big kind of scale and how stuff moves around and gear. And uh, I was raised by a bunch of old English crew guys, you know, old school dudes in that, that gig. So it was just a... Well, tell us a little and, more about how that Ozzy gig came about. Well, he was, uh, he was jamming right around the corner at Frank Zappa's place, Joe's Garage. Oh, yeah. And then so... Uh, uh, Bobby, the owner of this place, his brother-in-law uh, went and jammed with Ozzy, and he said, "Hey, go jam with Ozzy." And I, I just went to go jam with him one time to, you know, say I jam with Ozzy. And then, yeah, about three weeks later, I'm living in Ireland with the guy. I didn't even have a passport. I had to scramble, get a passport, and jump on a flight. I'd never been out of the country. I'd never seen snow in my life. So it was a winter time in uh, in Ireland. So I, I got a, out of the plane. I'm looking up at the sky. Ozzy's like, what are you doing? Get in the car. It's a freezing out here. You're, you're going to get sick, you know? And Do you think maybe you were more relaxed because you weren't thinking in terms of an audition and getting all tensed up, but just more? Probably. At least the first one. And then they say, okay, you're, you're, you're in the top 10. Okay. You're in the top five and process of elimination, lots of jamming and learning songs. And, um, yeah, then you're off and running. How long know? were you? You were with them quite a while, weren't you? Yeah, uh, I think uh, 90 to 98, you know, we're still great friends, you know, um, and uh, Zach's still playing with them. Yeah. So, and Zach's my neighbor. So we, we see, we just yeah. played with Ozzy in Copenhagen. Is that where it was, Brian? Copenhagen, we played with Ozzy? Yeah. Yeah. He I came was, through Detroit yeah. last year. I interviewed Blasco. Oh, nice. Yeah, and Zach was there. And then I saw Zach again with the uh, Generation X tour. Oh, right, right. He's yeah. doing Hendrix now. Right. Uh, yeah, well, in fact, we were supposed to play in Australia with uh, Ozzy. And um, and I think he has pneumonia, so oh. he can't go. So oh, I think I saw something about it. Tell me something about Ozzy that, uh, that we might not know. Actually, Ozzy is like a... a he, he, he pretty much what you see is what you get with that guy you know there's no like he, he's that guy you know there's no secrets and he, he's he's just whoops so sorry he's uh just such a real fun guy you know i mean he he my, my favorite moments with ozzy were uh they'd have a, a drum solo for about 10 minutes and then zach wilde would do a guitar solo for like 10 or 15 minutes you know so every night during that uh that time period me and ozzy would be in his quick change like pissing in buckets together and just cracking jokes and eating <laughs> eating potato chips or whatever you know so at the I, same time my best memories of ozzy though it's just me and him in these big arenas and stuff just sitting in a quick change just you know yeah. he'd ask me about my grandmother and my mom how's your how's your grandma oh you know great thank you you know it's just really a that's nice cool guy. that's cool <laughs> now you've been with alice in chains for like over 25 years right 93 okay yeah, january 93 so one thing, when I think of you, it, it's it's almost like like Robert Trujillo was with, with, with Metallica much longer than Cliff Burton, or even uh, 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 what the Jason Chef was in Chicago much longer than Peter Cetera. Yeah. Well, you know, Jason, and, he's great. Yeah, yeah, I interviewed him a while back. Yeah, we go golfing. Oh, yeah, he's one of my golf buddies. Cool. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, Daryl Jones will probably be in, in the Stones longer than Bill Wyman was. Right. Do do you feel any of that with with this band? Because uh, or or do you feel at the beginning was there a sense of that you were trying to play like Mike Starr or not play like Mike Starr or did any of that there, ever... there wasn't really a whole lot of time to think about that stuff uh, I did a 16 month Aussie tour and then um, we took two weeks off to mix the um, live and loud record it's called and uh, so during that time we were mixing and and uh, Sean Kinney called me up and said hey uh, can you fill in for Mike and I was supposed to go down to do Rock and Rio with um, Nirvana, Red Hot Chili Peppers. And then he said Mike wanted to do that last show and to meet him in London. So from getting off the Aussie tour, going, mixing a live album, 
uh, getting a phone call, jumping a flight to London. We did um, three rehearsals. And if you count the Jules Holland um, a TV show, we, it was 27 gigs in 32 days in 16 countries. That, that was the stat, right? So there was no time to talk about that, you know, think about stuff. I was just like learning songs quick and we were all in a bus together and uh, trial by fire, band and crew in one bus and we just went for it, you know? And I, I kind of wasn't used to that. We're used to being, you know, spoiled on the Ozzy band, and, yeah. you know, private jets and the band has their own bus and stuff. So <clears throat> that was as close as I got to a van tour was that first Alice in Chains tour. You know, things things went qu quickly when once yeah. dirt went so big. Right. Yes. And then that year we did Jar of Flies record. Right. Uh, and then straight into Lollapalooza, which was like Tool, Alice in Chains, Rage Against the Machine, Primus, Fishbone, some just talk about great bass players. That, yeah. that was uh Really uh, a good tour for all of us cool bass players to kind of hang out and you know hang out with Norwood Fisher. Oh yeah, he, he <laughs> Fishbone was the best best band on that bill. I, I interviewed yeah. him just like I'm interviewing you now. He sat and ate the whole time. I'm oh, interviewing. Yeah. Sounds like Wood. <laughs> yeah, he's. I just ran into him at Nam. He was there at the Warwick booth. You know. Oh, I didn't see him this year. But uh, yeah, so went into that and then then we we're off and running. So uh, there there really isn't a whole lot of time to. Re reflect we're not, we're not those kind of guys e either we're looking forward like today i'm sitting with you and we're going to new zealand in uh you know 72 hours or something like this or you know we're, we're out of here so we're, we're looking forward we did i think 20 25 countries last year and we have 19 more to go and uh then we're done yeah we do we do new zealand australia canada and the states then we start in Finland, Moscow, St. Petersburg, go down Eastern Europe, and in Athens, take a break, uh, come back and do amphitheaters all summer, and then we're end the tour for this this album cycle. So yeah, by then we'll be tired. So yeah, I'm tired Welcome just our, listening. I'm, I'm fucking tired already. <laughs> uh, I think you mentioned Warwick at one point. You've been playing Warwick basses for darn near forever, for an awfully yeah, long time. Yeah. You play what streamers, star bass? Talk to me about your Warwick oh, basses yeah, and these, these cool like uh, streamers and. Uh, they just fit my hand for some reason. I remember I was going through on an Aussie tour, uh, a theater tour. We were building up for the big um, No More Tears um, arena tour in the States, but we did uh, one round of the world called the Theater of Madness tour. And I, I used to play these old Fenders, and then uh, I was going through Germany. I think it was Frankfurt, and there was a knock on the back door, and this guy named Woody Wallen. I don't know if you know Woody. He used to work for Hans Peter way back ah. in the day. And there was a knock at the door, and uh, he, he comes in, and he hands me... He hands me this bass right here. And uh, this very one. Yeah, this one right here. And you can tell it's an old one. It has the dots on the neck. I think they're making some now with some dots on the neck, but this is old. And if you look at the back of this too, I'll show you. Yeah. There is a th this is on its third headstock, I think. Really? And this one, and then yeah, it even says I know Zazi Wood up there. And then I have another one that's a, my main one that's the Moonburst uh bass that, that's been on pretty much every tour I've ever done 30 years on, on these bases just last you know yeah. and that one's on its fourth headstock so just being beat up and stuff you know it's just like they they uh lasted trial by fire kind of thing like we were talking but but this one yeah was my first one Ozzy uh liked the sound of it it was real bassy and they used to use these old EMGs in here and uh, I think they they switch up their pickups now, but you're still an EMG artist, aren't you? Or you use EMG pickups? Uh, I I, I kind of like if like if you just look at this vault here, I got some uh, great Fishman, I got some great MEC pickups on the star bases here. I got um, uh, Rex Brown from from uh, Pantera. He gave me his new set of um, Seymour Duncan ones, and so my trusty tech Scott just threw them in this white base for rehearsals here. These are, these are all the B bases, by the way. They're, these aren't the A ones. The A ones are already in uh, Auckland, I think, waiting for us. Okay. So yeah, so we just kind of mix and match, you know. And, uh, and tell me about amps and strings and effects and things like that. Amps are just uh, ampegs. I love ampegs. Um, I have a really good collection of bass amps, but. Like, for instance, on our new record, Rainier Fog, I used a 69 uh, Ampeg head I bought, bought off the Van Halen guys. And so I, I use that, just an old blue line, uh, 69, uh, a new cabinet, and then uh, and then my one Moonburst Warwick. That's the only, and, and a little bit of a Sans amp. I just really feel like the less you use on bass, the better. Tell me about that Sans amp. Tech 21 has, has got some incredible stuff. 
I only like the pedal ones. I don't like the rack ones, and uh, we're we're fussy. We, it sounds so good though, just the way it is. We we try not to mess with it, you know. But you use the you use the Sands amp a, a lot, right? You use it all the time. Yeah, just the pedal one. I think we got one here somewhere. But uh, just just a little pedal guy, and then uh, Doug Pinnock from King's X gave me a couple of his new. Um, uh, the, his new distortion, which yeah. is really cool, and then and Tech Twenty One makes that cool fly rig too. Yes. So, um, like when I go play on other people's records, I just grab a couple pedals, and uh, you know that's when I kind of experiment a little more. With Alice in Chains, it's pretty defined how my sound is supposed to sound within the skeleton of our band that we've been, you know, touring on for 25, 30 years. You know, and which is just basically real heavy, yeah. just heavy, um, gritty. Uh, with a pick yeah. almost exclusively, right? Except for yeah. when you can get away with playing with your fingers sometimes, if that's an accurate yeah, way of putting it. I can play with my fingers. I've done whole tours. We we opened up for Velvet Revolver when those guys were touring. We did an amphitheater tour one summer. And just to prove to myself, it was a stupid ego thing, too. I was like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna play with my fingers this whole tour. So I did that, you know. And then it just wasn't my sound. I really need that cut, and I'm slamming yeah. bass chords and stuff. But I, I did it, so I got to check it off. But on the other hand, it's like I felt like, uh, I should have just done my thing and not worried about it. What, what, what is that? You know what I mean? It was stupid for me to go, okay, I'm going to do that. But I'll play with my fingers sometimes if we need some sort of like more of a muffled thing, like with heart. Um, oh, yeah. I would use a lot of like you can't uh, you, you can't play Dream Bone Annie with uh, <laughs> Ampeg on 10 and just and a distortion pedal going and slamming it with p chords with a pick. You know, Dream Bone Annie is very delicate or Barracuda on the other hand. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> And same thing, same basses, you know. Yeah. Uh, I interviewed Steve Fossen a while back. Oh, he's great, yeah. I, I uh, had to learn all his lines. I didn't realize how just fucking great he was. You know, he's, he's the next level bass player. I like bass players that are bass players, you know. Oh, yeah. that, Tell me a little more about technique and if, if there are up-and-comers or people that want to play rock or play any kind of music on the bass, do you have any observations as far as what what they may do, be doing right or what they may be doing wrong what what do they need to think about that maybe they are or maybe they aren't just kind of like find your own voice like with me i was uh, copying you know roger glover and and um d murray from elton john's my favorite bass player right and geezer butler having to learn bob daisy lines for yeah. uh, uh, the early aussie stuff or um you know it just kind of like out of all the styles when you're jamming like you'll, you'll pick your style out of it find your voice you know a lot of guys just kind of go through and they don't really find their voice they don't know what amp is their voice they don't know um a lot of guys don't even know why they're playing music i think they're into it for the <laughs> wrong reason you know um i i always say this i make a joke about it i'm totally unqualified to do anything else on this planet but play the bass and go on tour you know and do the and make, make a bunch of noise in these places and well, good that you found your calling yeah very nice yeah i I'm not uh, complaining, you know. It's 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 a it's been a hell of a ride so far, and just just a lot of fun. But my thing is, I don't even care what style of music the bass player is playing. Just keep it in tune, and think song, think song. That's what I learned from Lee Sklar. You know, it's not serve the song. Lee always serve, says serve the song. Yeah, it's so important. And uh, you know, a lot of guys go in there and they overplay, and then a producer strips them back, and and then. They, they don't realize why until the vocals harmony start coming in and the vocals and the guitars on top and you, oh okay there's there needs to be room for this other stuff to happen you know with lee it's almost yeah. like a badge of honor all the thousands of records he's played oh, yeah. on and he's how many solos have you taken lee zero yeah, except i heard uh, your yeah. smiling face with uh, james taylor when he goes boom 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 it was like the closest thing to a solo i think we, we got and here's lee he's awesome i, I want to be lee when i grow up to be honest you know <laughs> uh, but we um we, we got nominated for a Grammy this year. That's right. Oh, I'm sorry. Congratulations. Yeah. And we didn't win, but we, so we, we went. You were nominated, and, though. And we went to the, uh, they had the pre a thing at the Nokia Theater, yeah. uh, which is a big amphitheater right next to the Staples Center. Then they had the real one at the Staples Center. And then at the convention center, they had the big after party for everybody. So I walk into the Grammys and I sit down in my seat and I look up and in that house band, Lee Sklar's up there with like Tim Palmer playing. And like they, 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 got, they hired all the L.A. session um, hot guns, you know, and it was just awesome. I walked in, waved to Lee, you know, and he's up there playing bass and, you know, just doing his thing. He's great. I've interviewed him at least three times. He's a great guy. Yeah, he inspired me to read more, too, when I um, uh, talked to Lee uh, 
you know, he, 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 he says that he has to read because he, he, and same with Kenny Aronoff, like they have to read because they don't have a whole lot of memory and they, they do so many jobs that they have to just like read fast. And he's such a master at that. So he inspired me to read. There's this book that is my go-to for reading. It's called The Evolving Basis by Rufus, Rufus. Reed. Yeah, Rufus Reed is just a, a, but I mean, they just start you with whole notes on open strings, right? It's a, so that's one thing for up and coming bass players that learn to read. Like a lot of guys don't do that. For 20 years of my career, I would transpose it into treble clef because I was a saxophone player in high school and college at Pasadena City College, right? And so I would transpose everything. And then up a sixth or up a, <laughs> yeah, up a ninth. Just, or yeah, and then, then and mainly it was just notes, you know, and um, or, or, or I didn't sketch out every, like Kenny Aronoff's charts are every hi-hat stroke, every, I mean, he's, he's, it's a work of art, it's hieroglyphics when, you know, it's amazing. But you had does. to consider the key also because of the wood with the saxophone. If it would you play alto, tenor, would you play? Oh, I played tenor and then alto, yeah. Okay, oh, okay. But, so you had to go up a ninth and up a sixth. Yeah. But once I figured it out, it was easy to transport it. But then I started thinking, I, I really got to just get tight on, on reading bass um, cleft, you know. So Rufus Reed book for the evolving bassist, black cover. You, yeah. Uh, with the, the drawing of the guy playing the yep. uh, stand up on the front. And he yeah, has another one called book. Evolving Upward with Thumb Position. My thumb still hurts when I think about oh, those yeah, yeah, yeah. exercises. I've interviewed Rufus, Rufus a few times. He's, he's incredible. He's a great guy. Yeah, but where the reading, that's, where, that's yeah. where you find a lot of cool stuff that you wouldn't. Um, you play upright also? I don't. It's a whole, I'm too small. I'm a little Filipino guy. Oh, no, you're but not. It's, it's a lot of like scooping, you know, a lot of elbow action, more scooping, and it's just not my forte. Um, I had this talk about at the NAMM show with Stuart Ham, yeah. when, I, before I was ever in Aussie, I took a couple lessons from Stuart when he lived out here in Panorama City, right around the corner here. And uh, I quickly learned that in two lessons that I, I didn't want to be a funk bass player. I didn't have that capacity. And it was what, I didn't have my passion there to really go down that um, trail or rabbit hole and really get that going. And like guys like Billy Sheen will say the same thing, you know? Like there's so many guys out there that do killer slight like Stuart as a master yeah. but Victor Wooten yeah. you know there's so many guys that do that so well that um yeah that wasn't I knew that wasn't my voice you know I'm a I'm a I'm a rock and roll guy you know I'm gonna plug into that old amp that yeah. 25 year old amp pig right there and make a bunch of racket <laughs> that's kind of my thing what about you mentioned this tour is going to be going on for quite a while but after that how far can you see into the future what else you would like to do or is there a project or something that you've always wanted to do that you just haven't gotten to yet i'm not sure i got a um i got a magic phone it's weird like uh so i, I have time off with allison chains and uh zach wilder called me and i'll go out and do an Ozfest with black label society and then i get home and i was like oh i wonder what i'm gonna do and then anna and nancy wilson call and then i'm in heart for five years and then uh and jerry and sean call hey let's get the band back together and we start that and then when I'm home, usually I'll get calls for do sessions. I just did a record with um, a guy named Mark Morton from Lamb of God. So okay. it's, I think it's out or it's coming out March 1st, I think. But, uh, you know, so I got to jam with drummers like St uh, Steve Gorman from Black Crows. Mark Ford was on it. And Ray Luzier, Roy Mayorga, Miles Kennedy. He just got all his buddies to come down. And yeah. we, we hung out at the studio called Hybrid in um, New Newport Beach, I think it is, okay. somewhere down south, Orange County. And so we just all went down there and did Mark's record, and you know, so yeah, I just like jamming. So, so you just do, you're yeah, gonna you can take it as it comes. Yeah, every time we've made a plan with Allison Chains uh, about the future, it never happens. So we've learned to not make a plan and just kind of surf it a little bit. We we live more in the kind of um, in the in the moment now, you know. Well, it's working for you. Yeah, so far so good. What would you be? What would you I be? Lost any fingers and toes yet? <laughs> What would you be if you weren't a bass player, if you can imagine? Something outside of music. You made a very strong statement a few minutes oh. ago about being qualified to do only that. But oh, yeah, I'd figure something out. But the um, thing is, like, uh, I've been with my wife for 19 years, so uh, when I get home, if I'm home for too long, the house gets too messy, and she's like, hey, go find a tour. Get out of here for a couple months, you know? So she's real supportive like that. But, uh, God, I, I don't know what i do. Yeah, I don't really want to do nothing else. Yeah, it's a great life. People stop buying, give us bases and amps, and I mean, yeah. All right. Free potato chips. 
Free potato <laughs> chips. That now you just nailed it. That's the yes, the life of a rock star. People get into it for for chicks and for all that, and you know you get into it for the oh, yeah. for the the perks, the free potato chips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, on location at the top secret rehearsal studio for Alice in Chains. Good luck with the tour and everything Thank else. You so much, John. Thank you. Thanks with, for having with, me on your fine website with Mike Inez of Alice in Chains. I'm John Liebman. You're watching for bassplayersonly.com.